ancient literary texts are several steps removed from historical craft practice. Class and gender bias mean that literary texts were rarely written primarily for or by the people who were involved in textile production. But if we take the image of textile production in literary sources for what it is, i.e. a bystander's view, a view that is shaped both by historical practice and by literary preferences, then we can gain valuable insights in how craft was contextualized in the Greco-Roman world. I'm going to try and show that in this paper by focusing on literary sources where authors let textile workers voice comments on their tools, revealing attitudes and emotions associated with both their work and their tools. Now, admittedly, such comments are few and far between. The vast majority of literary texts that mention textile tools and how they are handled, first and foremost do so to indicate the craftsperson's skill. Of its tale of the weaving contest between Arachne and Minerva may illustrate this briefly here. Phrasing like without delay and sentence structure serve to generate a sense of rapid and competent handling of the weaving equipment where workers and tools appear interchangeably in the grammar of the text uh, as grammatical subjects. And that back and forth is what I've sought to illustrate here with the swap between green and red. So word order and sequencing indicate a workflow where the weaver works interchangeably with or without a tool, uh, or where weaver and tool uh, take turns to influence the outputs. Other texts occasionally use tools as stand-in for the workers themselves, projecting onto the tools skills and character traits which the workers demonstrate in relation to the craft. That happens in Claudian, for example, a couple of times. So in such snapshots of user tool engagements, there is actually little to indicate any specific emotional or otherwise connection between user and tool. One rather gets the impression that any well-functioning tool would be as good as another. This literary emphasis on user tool engagements as determined by functionality can be related back to the archaeological evidence, uh, evidence that explicitly privileges functionality as, a guide, as guiding user tool interactions. In a recent paper on spindle whorls at Vindolanda and Corbridge, Marta Alberti uh, discusses a spindle whorl with a graffito inst instruction as to the up and down side of the whorl. That graffito, Alberti believes, uh, may have been added by a user after completion of the world to improve functionality, uh, something that may reflect wider patterns of using decoration to reinforce craft practice. Now, obviously, functionality as a guiding principle for user tool engagements manifests in the archaeological material in very many ways. But to me, Alberti's findings provide a concrete, embodied basis for the common sense assumption that functionality influences all aspects of skilled production. The prevalence of tool functionality in literary texts, texts that speak primarily to an educated elite, who we can assume, where we can assume that the um, economic relevance of the actually uh, of the items actually produced were less prominent. Now that I find rather more intriguing. So having said all that, there is a small set of other literary texts that do indicate long-term use, that long-term use bestowed meaning beyond uh, the utilitarian and task specific on tools to their users. And that this was also perceptible to people around them. Two texts, interestingly, 
connect this specifically to use where traces. The first such instance appears in Claudian's uh, late antique mythological epic on the rape of Proserpine. After Proserpine has been captured by Pluto, her mother Ceres searches for her in their empty home and finds only her daughter's abandoned loom. To Ceres, the abandoned tools represent her daughter's talent and promise, and they evoke an emotional response by being hand-worn, atritosco e manu radios, and by being scattered about as if in play. The use where on Proserpine's radii seems mainly to establish that they belong to her. The emphasis, so to speak, is on her hand rather than on worn, and that she used them in her charmingly childish way. So that Ceres' viewing and handling of them in turn brings her closer to her missing daughter. However, Claudian's reference to Proserpine's handling of her, her tools has intertextual dimensions that go unnoted by Ceres, connections to other tool-describing texts. These texts, and I'll go into them presently, are at odds with Ceres' perception of Proserpine as a vulnerable child, and rather cast her as someone who willingly abandons her loom for more satisfying pursuits. The designation of Proserpine's tools as hand-worn has, as far as I'm aware, only a single parallel. That is a second century CE fictional epigram of dedication in Greek written for a Roman audience. This epigram, you have it on the slide, lists uh, textile tools dedicated to Athena. Initially, they are given positive associations. The pin beater, the kerkis, sings like morning birds, the weaving sword softly smooths the warp, and the comb orders the fibers well, all evoking a pleasant enough, well-working setup. Gradually, the text establishes a relationship between the tool and their user. The spindle is dactylotripton, hand-worn in line three, a term that posits long-term handling. And the wool thread in the basket has been cleaned by the spinner's teeth. From line four onwards, we see with the spinner's eyes, the spinner becomes the focalizer. Only she can perceive the spinning, uh, the swimming motion of the spindle as it fills with wool. And in line five, word order extends that focalization. The spinner's tooth pulls tufts of the thread before it lands in the basket. We follow her eyes from the tooth to uh, the wool landing in the basket. So far, the tool user relationship seems both reciprocal and productive. The final line, though, changes our perspective. As the craftswoman is named as bowed with age I sinue, the tools are called a gift of her poverty. So she has only been able to eke out a meager existence by her craft. Reading back again, then, the mention of use where reflect Isinua's age and her long, weary hours of work, something that uh, in literary terms is picked up again by the allusion to her biting off unevennesses in the thread with her teeth. In literary texts of this period, that is something that old women do. So when the text is focalized through Isinua herself, the tools are associated not with her uh, skill as a craftswoman, but with her limited ability to support herself. These texts on hand-worn tools are intertextually linked to a larger series of Greek epigrams where textile craftspeople define their tools as a means to make uh, a humble living. There are seven dedicatory epigrams in the Greek anthology that mention textile tools in this context ascribing to tool users attitudes that vary from the resentful and the restless to the trustful. As you can see here, 
Some epigrams uh, juxtapose the drudgery of textile work with the quick and easy money to be gained by prostitution. Here, a woman called Nicareta describes her tools as hunger-bringing works that steal the flower of her youth, implying that textile work is endlessly time-consuming, yet never yields sufficient income. Though these epigrams may reflect real professional choices available to poor women, they also tap into a literary topos uh, of disgust for women that are old and yet want to be sexually active. That is widespread in both Hellenistic and Roman literature of the time. And that in turn hints that characters like Nicarita and Bito, um, who defiantly reject their textile tools after having used them for a good long while, and who therefore cannot be young any longer themselves, are actually, when we read this text, also from a literary perspective, set up, ironically, to fail in their new career as well. <laughs> Poems of other genres also express a similar dependency, mentioning women weaving on rented looms to support themselves by their skill, despite not having space or equipment themselves. These women are consistently depicted as objects of pity. To connect to the likely future misfortunes of Nicarita and Bitor and their sisters, two of those weavers working on rented looms are former prostitutes, whose attractiveness has faded with age and left textile work as their only recourse. The juxtaposition of textile work and prostitution taps into another common cultural field of association for female textile work that of moral virtue. Some tools-focused epigram epigrams imply that textile workers may be poor, but they are morally good. This is also shown uh, in that their familial connections define them. They are daughters. Even in those epigrams, though, tools are a means to income. Here, we have three uh, young sisters uh, dedicating their tools, and they speak of the spindle as prosergon, translated here as laborious, but also associating the spindle with a work, a task that is paid for on completion. So here too, there is that direct connection to the generation of income. The dedication here is then concluded with a prayer to Athena for her continued support in securing a better standard of living. So in Greek epigram, textile tools are nearly always related to women's ability to support themselves financially. In Hodder's terminology of entanglement, the relationship between user and tools in these epigrams fits on a sliding scale from enabling dependence to dependency and indeed entrapment. There are parallels for these literary user attitudes to tools in the material record as well. A first century loom weight from Caesar Augusta bears an inscription um, linking textile, uh, diligent textile work both to marital and material good fortune. Now the inscription is made uh, before firing, so it's likely authored for rather than by women weavers, but at least here we can say with certainty that the audience is female and that it consists of weavers. Also, the weaver here is made complicit in the attitude is expressed in the inscription as the syntax shifts through the inscription and increasingly grants agency both to the user and the tools. It reads, and I love this so much, it's absolutely brilliant, may she weave many webs so that she may find a good husband. Love the loom waves. We make happy and fortunate things. The direct association between textile work and status or even happiness as a wife is of course obvious in that first line. But the word bonus used of the prospective husband and the formula fausa felicia 
do evoke material prosperity, if not necessarily luxurious wealth. Again, this is linked specifically to the tools, so much so uh, that the loom weights are given a voice. We make. That we is deliberately ambiguous and refers both to the loom weights on their own and to the productive unit of loom weights and craftswomen working in consort. So, to conclude, when literary sources do mention textile tools, user tool engagements are generally depicted as driven by functionality and need. Examples like the ones I've mentioned briefly here show that such attitudes also become evident in the material record. From this combination then of different types of evidence, we can begin to piece together a more secure and certainly more rounded picture of ancient textile work, coming perhaps a little tiny bit closer to lived experience. Thank you very much. <laughs>